Hello to everyone that has found their way here so far. We're going to get started in a few minutes. If you would, just go ahead and post a response to the prompt in the text box. We will begin promptly at 7 o'clock Eastern. The prompt is welcome. Please respond by letting us know where you're from and what you teach. From, I guess, sea to shining sea, right, across all four time zones. I am Ben Conklin, and sitting next to me is Regina Yunt. We're really excited to be with you. Uh, we want to share with you this experience that we've gone through using the civil conversation model. Uh, we're sitting here in North Carolina in Regina's classroom. She's a middle school teacher. I am a high school history teacher. And uh, we strategically sat ourselves in front of this board so it looks like we do a lot during the day. Um, we really do, but <laughs> we decided to keep it real and broadcast right from a student's desk. But again, it's really exciting to be here. Thank you all for attending and uh, devoting your time to experience this civil conversation model. So again, my name is Ben Conklin. Pleasure to be with you all. Regina Yunt, nice uh, to see you. Um, we want to talk to you today about this uh, civil conversation model. And before we really get started, we want to ask you for a little bit more feedback. If you would, go ahead and post in the text box, are you in the habit of using academic discussions in your classroom in a formal way? Obviously, we have discussions all day, every day in our classrooms, but do you use a purposeful academic discussion in a typical class over a marking period? So if you would, if you have a moment as we're going through this, just go ahead and uh, document whether or not you use this. And we're hoping our goal today is to impress upon you the value and importance of using this particular approach. Now, many of us do use this, but we aren't as purposeful with it as we could be, and therefore it might not get the yield that would otherwise be waiting for us. So half of this is actually like a pep rally almost like a call to arms because we see so much value in using this particular approach one for academic reasons which obviously we're going to stress but two for social reasons one of the things that we notice is the picture we see of ourselves on television these days isn't exactly the most flattering it seems that as teachers we may have failed our students for far too long it seems that some, when they leave high school, and by some I actually mean many, leave high school are not prepared, they're not equipped to have meaningful discussions and conversations with others who disagree with them. It's hard to solve problems when people can't talk to each other and see value in each other, and they can't find any common ground. So this model not only drives content that we're supposed to be teaching in our courses, but it prepares our students socially to solve problems in the future. And obviously, I put the blame on us as educators because maybe we haven't done a good enough job preparing our students. This, hopefully, will be part of a remedy to solve this issue. So hopefully, after experiencing this webinar, you'll see the quality in this approach and you'll want to use it in your classroom as much as possible. Now, I'd like to take you a moment and look at this picture here, I imagine many of us have experience with this. We have seemed to be living in an environment that values reinforcing beliefs that we already have, like a confirmation bias. We are attracted to ideas and examples that only reinforce what we already believe. And sometimes when confronted with things that we disagree with, we have an emotional response. And you may know from social media use or from other avenues that this picture right here rings true. I've heard both sides. Let me do some research. Oh, I agree with that. Oh, that must be true. I'm going to use that. And this, of course, escalates. We try to inform ourselves. We try to stay knowledgeable. We try to see value in discussions with others. But what we see of ourselves on TV might make us think we're not doing a very good job. In fact, much of the information we come across isn't exactly nutritional news. A lot of our information is like junk food, and it doesn't lead to solving any real problems. It almost seems like we're really good at dividing ourselves and not really finding common ground. So again, this approach is designed to facilitate social growth as well as academic growth. After all, if somebody disagrees with me, they have to be Hitler, correct? 
a child's guide to online political discussion. It seems when we don't practice and cultivate skills that we are trying to address here, that we default to automatically assuming that people who disagree with us must be terrible people. Obviously, we're not interested in promoting hate speech or not having any empathy for people who disagree with us for real, genuinely good reasons. But we have to be careful to not assume the worst in others. What it begins to happen, as we're all well aware, is that we grow up and we join these teams. We have these political parties, for example, in our nation that many of us subscribe to their beliefs. And we tribe ourselves into these teams, one versus the other. And whether it because, it's because of uh, lessons we had or experiences we had growing up, values instilled with us, we seem to entrench ourselves in these teams. And it's difficult to transcend them. I'm not saying that any one of these particular teams have a wrong philosophy. But what I am saying is we do seem to be trapped in this one side versus the other partisan atmosphere. These types of approaches that we will talk about with the civil conversations may be able to help us transcend this left versus right, one versus the other, us versus them mentality. We're really good at doing this, uh, but we might want to get even better at solving this problem before it gets any worse. One of the things I wanted to talk about with you all and why we see so much value in this is there may be an environment now where civil conversation is too difficult to achieve and our ideas of free speech may be self-policed. For example, there's a picture here that I came across while hiking in Virginia. And I took a picture of it knowing I would use it in my civics class because I found it rather interesting. This area has been set aside for individuals or groups exercising their constitutional First Amendment rights. And when I show this picture to my classes, many times students say, well, there's an implication that maybe you don't have this First Amendment right outside that area. Why is this sign specifically marking an area for free speech? Does it imply that you don't have a full measure of free speech outside it? And I use this to prompt students to understand that the United States is one of the only countries with a First Amendment that we, as we view it. Many countries have free expression, but there's laws on their books that would not pass constitutional critique in our own country. And students don't realize that the United States has one of the strongest protections of free speech and expression in the world. But we begin when we grow up and don't know how to have civil conversations with each other. We interpret things that we don't like or find insulting as some kind of actual violence. Now, no one's talking about physical violence, and obviously that's abhorrent. But when people start to interpret speech as violence, it immediately stops discussion. And we can't move forward or find common understanding. So, for example, there are some things that have creeped into our culture recently many of us are familiar with. This idea of being triggered. Triggered, of course, is a word that explains the emotional reaction that some people have when confronted with information that they're not interested in hearing. And we have to sometimes remind our students that we have a First Amendment so that people are allowed to get triggered. Not that that should be our goal and that we should work towards that, but we have a First Amendment so that we can say things that make people upset. We don't really have a First Amendment so we can ask people, you know, if they had a nice day. And importantly, we have a First Amendment so that we can make people in power uncomfortable. It's not so much that we have to worry about offending each other. We want to be able to offend those in power. So people sometimes get triggered and have an emotional reaction that also will stifle conversation. People sometimes interpret what are called microaggressions. I may address you or talk to you in a way that you find insulting, regardless of my actual intent. If I ask you where you're from and you happen to be an immigrant to the United States and you find that I have been disrespectful because I assumed you were not from the United States, I may have just been asking what town you were from. But that could be perceived as a microaggression. And the person who has perceived that microaggression will no longer be interested in having a conversation with you, at least a meaningful one. Also, this idea of safe spaces. We know many colleges and universities have denoted these specific geographical areas that students are not allowed to engage in 
language that may trigger some or be perceived as microaggressions. And what I want to discuss here is that this is an example of how we are kind of self-policing ourselves and it's making it, it more and more difficult to have civil conversations in public spaces with others. I'm not saying that any of this is wrong. I'm saying that we might want to take a look at what the environment itself is and how we can navigate it. So, I wanted to point out that if freedom, if liberty does mean anything at all, it does mean we should have the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. Because many times acceptable views aren't going to be insulting. But we have to sometimes say things that people are uncomfortable with to then reach an ultimately new truth that eventually no one actually has a problem with. It's hard to move forward if we're not allowed to make anyone feel slightly uncomfortable or if we're not able to deal with being slightly uncomfortable. Some of these images may be familiar from what we've seen in the news lately. This is a picture of the Berkeley campus in the 1960s, a hotbed in the civil rights and anti-Vietnam war protest movements. And of course, we see this banner here of free speech. On the same campus, a few months ago, there was a conservative speaker that had come and an audience that was not very happy with it. And they did not want this speaker on the college campus to engage in their speech. And of course, some people were big Trump supporters there. And we see that when we have these reactions, people are not going to be interested in having actual conversations. So seeing these images kind of reminded me of a, a song from Simon and Garfunkel. It reminded me of those lyrics that <clears throat> there are so many people talking, but no one's really speaking to each other. So many people hearing without actually listening to each other. But the more we force ourselves to grow silent and don't respect the idea of civil conversations and meaningful discussion, the worse off in the long run we might all be. So in addition to the social implications of this, there's also the academic implications. And I wanted to point out that regardless of what state you're in or whether you're looking at the common core, these approaches that we're using, these skills that we're trying to cultivate are a part of our standards. Again, regardless of state and locality, these are things that are not diverting from other very valuable classroom time and practices. This should be something that we embed in our practices, not seen as something that is stealing time from something else that we should be doing instead. So our civil conversation discussion involves a guide that you all have been given access to. And I just wanted to point a few things out. So hopefully you have these guides in front of you. And I wanted to address some of the specific steps that are part of this civil conversation guide. Step one is that it provides students with an example of how to annotate what might be difficult text. We are expecting our students when using this model to use all kinds of sources, sometimes even academic journals. Depending on what class you're in, you might only be afforded content that is difficult for the average reader. So these got, this guide here with how to annotate text is an important skill that translates across all curriculum. It's important for, of course, social studies and ELA, but any content area can use practice with annotation of the material they're working with. So step one is how to engage the actual text itself and be a critical reader. Step two, includes a graphical area on the model for students to record their thoughts. This will help drive their discussion and keep them on track. So they're trying to extract information from using step one and then put that information on the model for step two in hopes of facilitating a meaningful discussion using the class content and of course allowing you to have all kinds of teachable moments. Step three clarifies rules that students should use when talking to each other. And these are common sense approaches. But sometimes when you take several common sense things and purposely combine them, the power of them is magnified. So step three, we're going to look out a little bit deeper in the next slide. Step four on the civil conversation model offers the students an opportunity to self-assess. This often makes them feel a little bit more comfortable. This doesn't come across as an I gotcha assignment or I 
taught you not doing something you were supposed to, but it also empowers the students. And it gives them the ability to think critically about their own conduct, and it might make them want to actually engage more the next time because they see value in it, not because you told them they should. So again, step three, I wanted to look at in a little bit more detail. Step three of the civil conversation model is the list of rules. Everyone in your group should participate. You should listen carefully to what others are saying. Step three, or rule number three is my particular favorite. Ask clarifying questions. When I first go over this model with my students, I spend some time discussing what clarifying questions mean, and I often ask them to practice with each other. So for example, if you say something and I say, what did you mean when you said, or I'm not quite sure I understood that when you said, basically, when you ask a person to clarify in some way, they know you're listening. And whether it's conscious or subconscious, it goes, it's appreciated. And it goes very well in them engaging and respecting what you're trying to say. So as simplistic as this rule is, part three, I think, is very important in this list of five important things to focus on. Four, be respectful of what others say. And five, refer to the text to support your ideas. This is where that annotation and the step two where they recorded in their little graphic organizer what to say. Step five really helps move that along. So looking at these five things, we might remind students that body language is also important and many other forms of communication, not just the actual words coming out of our mouth. Tone, of course. So use this as an opportunity to discuss the ways that people communicate. I've read that communication is far more than obviously just the words coming out of your mouth. So the important of this too is we want to make sure our students understand that we have to create a culture in our country that values people talking to each other about difficult, sometimes controversial, or just things that they don't agree with. Because without debate or without criticism, as John F. Kennedy said, no country can survive. I would argue that no community could survive. No family can survive without the ability to talk and understand and listen to each other. So our civil conversation guide includes some really important ingredients. And if these ingredients are not in place, you will not see as much value as you otherwise could. The first thing is that this really is a structured academic controversy. Basically, it's grounded in text. They're learning or reviewing from material that is written down and they have to pull from. But what really drives this is the text itself should pose two different perspectives. We need some contention here. That's what really makes people uh, interested. And they often have some strong beliefs that they want to express. So the text needs to present two varying perspectives. And we're going to look at some examples of how important this is. And that's our job as coaches and as teachers in the classroom to provide these different perspectives. Of course, the discussion must be completed in small groups. If this model is used as a whole class, it's too easy for individuals to hide. So we want to make sure that this takes place in small groups, in three or four, and then we can have a larger class discussion, not only about how the actual conversations went and we conducted ourselves, but what we learned from the discussion itself. Of course, our last bullet there, utilize that model. Use the model that has been proven effective. It makes your job much easier and, again, helps the students. So now let's take a moment to actually experience this model. Everyone should have in front of them the actual civil conversation model itself and also our first reading that we will use today. The How Should We Judge Our Nation's Founders? Now, this is a very timely piece. It's a perfect example of the great resources that the Constitutional Rights Foundation offers us. And we'll have some other places for resources that you can find at the end of this presentation. But the Constitutional Rights Foundation um, has done a great job in curating many articles and resources. This is one that I find to be very approachable, regardless of what level your class is. If you have a middle school level full of low-level readers, this would be an appropriate model to, or article to use. So I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to go ahead and read this article. 
of how should we judge our nation's founders. You'll notice at the end that there are two discussion questions provided. This makes it easier for students to fill in the part of the civil conversation model where they have to come up with some prompts. Some of their resources make it evident, some the students have to create themselves. Again, this is why this is a good approachable example for maybe lower level students or classes that haven't done this um, model before. So go ahead and please take a moment, read through how should we judge our nation's founders, and we'll come back when we're done. This particular reading, and I just want to point out that when we read something like this, the actual contention context, but we know that this is a timely issue. But here's the thing, many of us who haven't had lots of practice with civil conversations and maybe have emotional reactions to those that we disagree with, they look at this situation as us versus them or me versus them. And many of us think to ourselves, well, I'm a good person. I care about others. So if this person disagrees with me, it must mean that they don't care about other people, that they must not be capable of empathy. Or, like my wife will tell you, sometimes it goes like this. I'm a smart person. I'm kind of intelligent. So since I'm not the dumbest person in the room, if this person disagrees with me, it must be because they are, right? If I'm smart and I know I'm not that dumb, then if they're disagreeing with me, it must be me. It must mean because they're not that intelligent. Of course, that's not true at all. But many approach conversations with each other from that perspective. And even a simple reading like this may elicit that type of behavior in our own students. So that's what we're trying to catch. We are flirting with chaos here. We are inviting a measure of chaos so that we force the students to deal with it. Now, we're not saying that you have to use controversial issues all the time, but it would be helpful, and of course the kids get interested, it would be helpful to force the kids to learn how to deal with these situations in the safe environment that we provide instead of leaving, growing in what they think is an adult life and they're not capable of being emotionally responsible. So with this particular one, we see how it would really drive discussion with our students. We're obviously not capable of doing that with each other right here in this format. So what I wanted to point out is that this is very approachable for lower levels, but some of us may find this particular article perhaps a little too elementary for some of the classes that we teach. Maybe it'd be real good to go through it quickly, but if we wanted to get a little bit deeper, we might have to offer other perspectives, or we might have to offer other examples of articles. So in addition to the how should we judge our founders, I pulled up two other more recent articles about a very specific example. An example of Yale deciding to change the name of one of their colleges because they didn't want to be seen as endorsing a historical figure that was a supporter of slavery. So it's a direct example of our first article that we read. So to give you an example of how you could level this sort of practice and challenge maybe readers that are a little bit further along, we have two other articles that I want to look at. And hopefully you'll find value in them and see how this will create a lot more discussion in our classrooms, a lot more meaningful discussion. So if you would, turn to our second article. And I want to, before you actually read it, take a look at the article itself. Don't read it, but the format of it, for example, I want you to notice that there isn't really any source material on this. And that's something that we should really bring up with our students when doing these kinds of activities. Our default should always be who wrote this, when was it written, who were they writing it to, what is their maybe bias coming into the situation, what's a little bit of the context of what was going on around that time period or in that area. And when we cultivate a response to always question where our information is coming from and addressing what might be implicit biases, I think it really helps us go through the information and take more meaning from it. So looking at the second article, go ahead and take a moment to read through that. This is a letter from students at Yale addressed to the Yale president requesting that the name of one of their dormitories be changed. Go ahead and take a moment to read that, please. Prince, but that is not stopping us from having our own meaningful discussion in the chat box, so that's great. I also see that this particular topic hits extremely close to home for many of us. It makes me think that using this particular article in our classrooms would go over very well with our students. 
So I hope you finished reading that second article, the letter from Yale students and alumni to the president asking for John C. Calhoun to have, his, to have the name removed from their dormitory. They want to create a more inclusive environment and having a former defender of slavery in one of their, above one of their dorms was seen as inappropriate. So this second article, you may notice that there was far more opportunity to use that step one in our civil conversation model, the annotation. The first article wasn't really requiring much annotation from even lower level readers, but the second one with a higher level of writing would definitely require more of that skill to be practiced of using the annotation. But that becomes an example for us as the teacher in the classroom to point out maybe certain language or certain references that students wouldn't have understood. And of course, this particular article is providing lots of historical context if you are in the social studies classroom, mentioning John C. Calhoun and his impact in early United States history. So now, if you notice with the two articles, the first one did a great job of balancing and offering two different perspectives. And the Constitutional Rights Foundation's resources do a great job providing that balance for us. The second article was clearly one-sided, offering example after example of why students felt that this particular action needed to occur. So now, as the educator in the classroom, I feel like I wouldn't be doing a very good job unless I provided even further balance. I have one article that's already balanced, but doesn't provide a whole lot of context. One article that is very well uh, in tune to the subject at hand, but is overly biased or at least just represents one perspective, not that it's overly biased. But then the second thing we might want to do is include, or the third thing rather, is we might want to include this other article. So that brings us to our third and final article. I bet you didn't know you're going to be reading this much, huh? You actually got sent to class tonight, huh? All right, well, the third one, we can't erase history or simplify it. This one has more source material. It's not terribly long, but go ahead and take a moment and read through this, our final article, and then we'll see that balance I'm referring to that hopefully we're striving to achieve when using this kind of model. So go ahead and take a moment to read our third article, and we'll come back in just a few minutes. Many of us are finishing up with that third article. I see through our text box discussion that some of us definitely have, and I hope you can see that looking at these three examples of articles, again, the first one provided by the Constitutional Rights Foundation, great material, easily digestible, uh, confronts us with this question, how should we judge our nation's founders, and provides balance within that article itself. Then the second article was clearly from one perspective and did not offer a whole lot of balance. The third article also from one perspective and did not provide a whole lot of balance. But taken as a whole, all three articles, I do think, do a fair job at arming students, regardless of what side they particularly believe in, with sound examples on how they could drive a conversation and move forward. All three individually might not be the best depending on your classroom. Certain, regardless of classroom, would not be the best to use on their own, like the second or third article. But in conjunction with all of them together, it's a great example of how we have the responsibility of providing this balance to our students. So with this model being shown to you, I hope you could see how you might be able to use it after carefully choosing your own articles that you would like to use and help drive civil conversation in our classes. If you would, please take a moment to post in the text box about the potential benefit of using this classroom. Will it challenge students? Will it help them learn the actual content? Will it provide you with lots of teachable moments? Or do you think maybe there are some concerns you would have with using this approach? If so, hold off on those because we'll address them in our next slide. Yeah, I'm really appreciating some of the feedback that we're getting here in the text box. It seems that uh, many of you see the value in using multiple perspectives like this. Uh, and some of us are well aware of our own class's limitations, that we would not be interested in going beyond like that first article, for example, that going any further might be too much of a challenge. Of course, we might want to ultimately work towards getting to that level and practicing annotation skills but it might take too much time with some of the classrooms that we're given. Of course, with your professional discretion, I imagine you will find the perfect balance in using various articles with this approach. Let's talk about some frequent concerns. 
We've had lots of positive feedback about this model and countless teachers have been using it with our own experience over just the last two years. But we've also gotten some feedback on concerns people have had. So we wanted to share with you all of the different types of frequently held, heard concerns. And the two that are in red font are by far the ones that we had the most feedback about. So I want to point those two out specifically. One, that students show little motivation to actually converse with each other. And I wanted to point out, because that is a frequent concern people share, that having these small groups really does help get past that. The students can't hide when it's only three or four students. Another important thing to focus on is the actual article itself that provides that contention or implicit disagreement. The more a student sees an argument at play, the more likely they are to adopt the side of that argument and try to uh, engage in it. But I did kind of make a mistake there. I said the word argument. I may have even said debate throughout this conversation. And when we're in the classroom, I do suggest that we try to camouflage this language. We don't want to use words like debate and argue. We want to use conversation, discussion. We're not trying to act like two litigators in the, in the courtroom and go back and forth in some completely adversarial nature. This is designed to move us past that. We have to expect that it will occur, but we also have to have the understanding that it's our job to help navigate these students through those types of reactions. So the second frequent concern that people have, students lack context. This is a huge concern. What I hope is that that lack of context is really just an opportunity. If they engage in a conversation about a topic that they're really interested in, chances are they're going to want to learn more about it. And that context that lacks will not be lacking for long. They will fill that void with information that they want to consume. So our goal with this is to sort of make them want to be like a sponge with certain topics. And if we do a good job of creating connections between the content in class, what we see in the article, and their own real life experiences and beliefs, they will not forget the information that we're trying to get across to them. So as we all know as educators, creating those connections with students are what's going to make them remember this material and see value in it far long after they're out of our classrooms. So if this allows us, if this civil conversation is a vehicle I can take us down that avenue. We really should be using it as much as possible. As you can see, there are many other concerns up there, and I'm seeing lots of feedback in the text box. Some of you have seen this in all kinds of lessons, let alone in trying to facilitate these civil conversations, but I imagine all of us are capable of moving past them with practice. And finally, in addition to saying thank you very much for giving us your time and allowing us the opportunity to share this information with you, we need to share with you some resources. Where can you find many of these types of articles that automatically provide balance and very timely issues? Of course, the Constitutional Rights Foundation is full of them. But we also have Carolina K-12, give it up to North Carolina. Ooh, ooh. And we also have New Zella and Procon.org. These are all great sites so that you can find shovel-ready examples of articles to use with this civil conversation model. So hopefully it won't take up any more time than what you've already given to us with actually employing the lesson, not having to spend lots of time searching for these resources. Again, my name is Ben Conklin, and I'm here with Regina Yunt. It was a pleasure delivering this to you all. I hope you see value in it and that the importance of it moving forward for our students.